burning 88 million barrels of oil per day. That's the rate of supply that's required to, to run society. Fossil fuels also involve huge flows of money. The oil money often fuels tyranny, instability, and corruption. Uh, it is behind many of the conflicts in the world. We actually pay about 10 times more to sustain military forces meant to intervene in the Persian Gulf then we pay to buy oil from the Persian Gulf. This is obviously crazy. But it is an addiction we have fallen into and need to cure ourselves of. If the ability to grow oil supply ceases, and that's likely to happen sometime before 2020, the geopolitical issues will only accelerate. So if we don't do anything, the prognosis is not particularly bright. I mean, you know, for the economy, for geopolitical disruptions, for wars, for actual physical shortages. So all of these unconventional energy sources, I do think that they'll they'll grow rapidly, partly because a lot of the easy oil and gas is already gone. Now we have to go after these other harder sources if we want to keep the oil and gas flowing. As the engine runs short on fuel, its pollution and violence is backing up into Western society. Nowhere is that more obvious than in domestic fights about fracking. The natural gas and oil is found very deep under the ground. And in order to bring that oil and gas up to the surface, they drill horizontally, in many cases, a couple of kilometers. And then they do the hydraulic fracturing. They open cracks up in the rock. But one of the things that makes it especially hard in the United States is that the people living on the land don't necessarily own the oil and gas below it. So we have people who, who own, the, own the property, may have lived in a house or on a ranch or on a farm for 20, 30, or 40 years, um, don't own the mineral rights. In many cases, don't know that they don't own the mineral rights. And then someone else comes in and puts, uh, puts drilling on their property. Yes, you have different opinions. Uh, when they heard they were coming in, a number of people are excited because they, most of the people have leased their land. So I would say over 90% in our county are leased. So they're, they're encouraged to get royalties, so they're looking forward to that. So they're hoping to get some extra money. And a lot of people need money. They're in difficult situations with the economy. So they don't think about what it could mean. So for them, it's just, uh, I'm going to get extra money. And then there's others, like myself, who are very concerned about the industrialization and the contamination. The well is back here. Um, December 6, 2011. We noticed it was erupting, and our water turned dark gray. So the DEP came out and tested our water. The first test, the results were 38.9 milligrams per liter of methane in our water. Um, they came back out a couple months later and retested. It had gone up to 58.4 milligrams per liter. 
that's in our water. It's, it's real funny that we had wells drilled on both sides of us, and next thing you know, we got problems, that, with the problems that weren't there before, you know? It's very controversial in our area. They drive neighbors against neighbors. People that normally wouldn't hate you, hate you because you have water problems now. And Yeah, you know, my other half, she got all pissed off with me because I was fighting with them all the time. I was like, you know something? I'm trying to protect what we own from being destroyed. We already lost the water. And she was mad because I was constantly fighting with them. You know, her thing was, you know, just lay down and be a good little gas whore. And it's like, no. Nah. So she walked out on me because of all the fighting. Uh, other neighbors over here, they got divorced over the fighting. Neighbors over here got divorced over the fighting. And then you have neighbors pissed off because you got signs in your yard, you're fighting the industry. Uh, you have other ones that from the town. Well, there's nothing wrong with our water. Well, thank God for you, you don't have a problem. But over here, we do. Despite all of the wealth that they have created and convenience that they offer, fossil fuels are becoming quite threatening to our way of life. É o que eu digo de uma crise civilizatória. E uma crise civilizatória não tem como ser enfrentada a não ser por todos uma mobilização de todo o tecido social na forma não apenas de um questionamento à nossa maneira inadequada de fazer as coisas, mas, sobretudo, um questionamento de natureza mais profunda à nossa forma inadequada de ser. É disso que se trata. E isso é válido para o Brasil, para o Japão, para a Altamira ou para Nova York. Countries are responding to that crisis by tapping whatever energy sources they have available. In Brazil, hydropower is favored. It is one of our ship's greatest renewable resources. Globally, only about one third of its potential has been tapped. O Brasil tem uma abundância de rios. Nossa matriz energética ela é basicamente é, feita pelo aproveitamento dos rios. Esse, essa riqueza natural que nós temos de energia limpa e sustentável, nós usamos é, diferentemente do resto do mundo. O Brasil, 70% a 80% da nossa energia é a energia hidroelétrica limpa. Brazil's biggest hydro project is on the Xingu River. The Belamonte hydro plant will require a 26-kilometer diversion of river water to create 11 million megawatts of electricity. Local people say the project is destroying the rainforest and the river itself. The massive project was delayed repeatedly by environmental concerns and now proceeds in controversy. At a meeting with power officials, they voice their complaints. Belo Monte Ela não traz só o impacto ambiental. Né? Mais do que o impacto ambiental, Belo Monte traz um impacto à diversidade socioambiental do Xingu. Diria que se o Xingu é o coração do Brasil, o peixe né, é uma fonte de alimento, uma fonte de proteína muito importante para os povos indígenas, e para os extrativistas e ribeirinhos dessa região. Quando você ameaça o peixe, você ameaça a segurança alimentar desses povos. Que é exclusivamente 
para enganar a gente, para mentir, para que não vai dar esse impacto todo. Só não, não vai dar esse impacto todo. Essa madeira eu botei ainda agora. Tá aqui, ó. Pouquinho. Quando é muito, quando dá bastante, a gente tira 30, 50, 60 numa rede dessa. E caride, primeiro você botava uma madeira dessa, um corte de madeira dessa com quatro madeiras, você tirava 100, 180, até 200 caris. Agora tá aí o tanto, ó. Nós pegávamos duas caixas de 160, três caixas dentro de três dias. Dois dias, três dias. Hoje nós passamos cinco dias e não pega três caixas de 160. Esse é um projeto muito complexo. Do ponto de vista social, há uma situação de alto impacto negativo para as populações locais. Aqui no Brasil, e eu particularmente, não temos uma posição ideológica contra as hidrelétricas. Elas são uma fonte de geração importante para o nosso país, mas não podemos ficar refém de uma única fonte de geração. Existem muitas coisas que podem ser consideradas nas zonas é, isoladas, como no caso da floresta amazônica ou no nordeste, mas também dentro das grandes metrópoles temos grandes dificuldades econômicas e sociais. Mas também dentro das grandes metrópoles temos grandes dificuldades econômicas e sociais. Other countries have found ways to tap their natural energies without creating environmental disasters. We are very lucky. We're situated on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and where the two, the North American and the Eurasian plates combine. We are a volcanic active country that has the geothermal resources underneath to tap into. We've been using geothermal, obviously, for a long time. It used to be for bathing, for heating houses. Women used it for um, washing clothes, and that was a big thing in Reykjavik. And then uh, in 1930s, we started really harnessing the heat for district heating, and that was the first we used. And then um, later on, we started producing electricity. Tapping that power allowed cold and barren Iceland to become self-sufficient in food. Vegetable growing in Iceland started around 1940. Geothermal makes it possible to grow inside of these greenhouses all through the year. Iceland can produce enough vegetables, peppers, cucumbers, tomatoes, Anything that grows inside the greenhouse, we can produce. We have enough geothermal energy, uh, we have enough electricity, and uh, we, can, we can even uh, <clears throat> we can produce that much that we can feed a lot of Europe with our uh, growing. Underneath us is a geothermal reservoir, so we have hot water and steam in the ground, very hot, about 250 to 300 degrees Celsius. And what we do is we drill holes into that reservoir about two kilometers deep, get the hot steam up out of the ground, pipe it into the power plant where we separate all hot water from it and all droplets. Take it into a turbine and generator set and produce electricity. We use the hot water that comes out of the turbine to preheat cold water from the ground, and then we heat that water even further up with the hot water and then send it to Reykjavik for district heating. 
I think it's about 30% of our electricity um, that comes from geothermal, but over 90% of our heating comes from geothermal, which has tremendous health and social benefits for the country because you don't have to worry about gas or oil to heat your houses, which we do all year round.